Hey there everyone, new video time. So let's just get rid of the rocket that we had from last time and we're going to be doing a Atlas Kype rocket this time and this is an opportunity to use some of the new parts introduced in the newest NASA add-on. It's still a Mercury capsule so we're going to leave the top as it is but we want to have a, a wider a wider rocket at the bottom because this one's got to go and get us into a fixed orbit. So. Yeah, let's just trying to look at a way of expanding it so that we can use some of the wider rocket parts. And I think I'll probably just have to go with a structural piece. The um, new parts came with three and a half meter and two and a half meter parts. So I'm going to use the two and a half meter parts because the others would be really overkill. So. Yeah, I think I can make this happen with us. That's going to be like a an orbital stage there, just to get us up into orbit, and then one large stage underneath that's going to get us most of the way. The others, can, the smaller stage underneath the capsule is just going to be to circularize the orbit. But yeah, I think that should pretty much do it. As long as there's enough thrust in there to lift it, that should do it. And check the staging. Don't have any problems. So yeah, this was a Mercury Atlas mission, but it's going to be called a Juna Kerbless mission for mine. And I'm saving the Kerbless launcher into the subassembly so I can use it in the future if I need to. Because it was used again in the Gemini missions, so at least it's there ready for me to use. And here we are on the launch pad. The final Kerbal, Bob Kerbin, is waiting in the capsule ready to launch and I think I've screwed up the staging I'm just checking the retros are in the right place okay and prepare for launch and that is a really nice and powerful rocket actually there's been a, a lot of complaints that these parts are overpowered and in this one I can kind of see it even though I've only got a tiny payload this time and I added small um, rockets at small engines on the bottom because I wasn't sure if this had any gimbaling um, so I added those really quite a nice takeoff I'm really happy with this it's the first time I've done it I've not done any simulations of this rocket out of out of recording so the fuel flows good the over I'm a bit worried about the overheating and I'm realizing that I'm getting quite a lot of acceleration this low down in the atmosphere so I'm gonna pitch over quite early because I don't, I don't have him going up to 600,000 meters of high orbit or, or anything when he's not really required. God, yeah, this is really fast. Oh, oh, bugger. And just missed the rockets clipping the capture. Oh, I don't think I've got enough fuel by a long chance. Okay, well, here we go. Trying again. Nice clear launch, I'm going to be a bit more careful with the overheating this time. So yeah, just feather it on half throttle and I'm still accelerating, so that should be enough. And yeah, this, this launch is going to be a bit slower than the last one, so here's the opportunity to take a look at the capsule. It's the same Mercury capsule that was used last episode. And here's what the launch vehicle looked like in real life. As you can see, it tapers in towards the top, but it's a heavier lifting body to make sure it could get the pilot into orbit rather than just accomplish a suborbital flight. And seeing as this is the last time I think I'll be using this capsule, here's an interior view of the Mercury capsule. And what you can see here from this diagram, I mean, the writing is a little small, but it was uh, the original document. Um, so you might not be able to see what the labels are, but I'll walk you through it quite quickly. Uh, in the center of the capsule you can see the pilot, you're looking down at the top of his head and he had a little control panel in front of him and to his left and to his right was the joystick for orientation. Behind the pilot on the external of the vehicle is the uh, retro rockets which I've done with RCS in mind and I think actually the Mercury capsule that I've done is the most close to life out of any of the ones I've done so far. 
because even though mine has an RCS tank on the bottom and the Mercury capsule doesn't, what the Mercury capsule did have was that after the retro rockets fired, they would detach that little pod on the outside to reveal the whole curved side of the heat shield, but that would also expand away from the capsule and there'd be an inflatable bag underneath which had the same depth as my RCS tank does there. So yeah, I'm quite happy with the overall shape of it. Um, the capsule itself had RCS motors, it was way more advanced than the Russian one, and in specific this flight is the uh, flight of John Glenn who, you know, on Friendship 7 and oh, we're just about to disconnect there we go disconnect the escape tower and now we're just left with the capsule and its RCS and the stage that's going to circularize our orbit and then disconnect to burn up with the retro rockets so yeah this is the John Glenn later to become Senator John Glenn his his rocket um, it was actually designated as Mercury Atlas 6. The first five were fully operational Mercury capsules or boilerplate Mercury capsules that were launched on an Atlas rocket um, just to make sure that they would survive. They threw up a lot more a lot more rockets into space before they put an astronaut in than, they did, than the Russians did. He was in orbit for three orbits. The entire flight took four hours, 50 minutes until... He was put onto the deck of a aircraft carrier after a splashdown. And it went incredibly well for him. The only issue was that he wasn't quite prepared. I'm not sure whether it was a mistake with the machine or whether it was him not being used to it. He wasn't quite prepared for the re-entry heat. And when he got into a situation that he wouldn't drown, he popped the escape door on the capsule and climbed out himself but yeah th this flight's going really well and what I'm going to do is I'm going to speed up time after I have my capsule for the orbit so I'm going to give it a few orbits just to be true to life first let's just lose that retro stage there and leave us with the capsule in orbit as he's just about to go into the dark side we've got a fairly good orbit and yes, that's ta I've just targeted that to make sure it's definitely going to re-enter and it will burn up quite soon. So yeah, there you go, it's... Oh, accidental EVA, let's just pretend that didn't happen. So what happens when you press the wrong button? I meant to go inside to see the camera view, but I ended up pressing the EVA button. And let's just orient ourselves to watch the sun set and then he'll be coming back around the other side to see it rise and the dirty looking clouds you can see in the atmosphere thanks to that mod it'll be in the description at the bottom speed time up because I don't want to sit here for the actual five hours it would take to do this mission And we're popping up. And he got to see this three times on his trip, and he landed in the daylight. Picked up by the USS Noah. The Mercury mission was incredibly successful for the Americans. Not only did they get into space, it, like I say, due to the actual amount of rockets they threw up at, at this mission, um, they got a lot of knowledge for developing the Saturn series of rockets which is basically a scaled up version of the Atlas and that helped them get to the moon and leapfrog a lot of what the Russians were doing um, when their Energia rockets and their N1 rockets started to fail they had already got a successful working base because the Vostok rockets that they ended up using for the modern day Soyuz rockets they the, N, the R7 class wasn't a long-range rocket. What the Americans did was they had a long-range rocket family basically built from the beginning and they didn't need to put that work in later. So yeah, he's had a bit of a look around. 
little bit of a play around in space, just checking out the rotation abilities of his vehicle, and I'm now going to speed time up just to give him a few orbits there. That's the mission objective. So I'm going to try and come back when the space center is in the daylight, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a maneuver node so I know how much I've got to burn off, and, and then I'm going to try and do it in map mode so I can be as precise as possible. My aim is to just get either in the water each side of the continent the space center is on or uh, onto the continent itself and do a hard landing. But what I'm doing now is I'm pointing in the right direction and then I'm switching on the RCS by pressing R on the keyboard and then if you press H on the keyboard it will fire the RCS engines in the forwards direction which in my case will slow me down. The reason I'm doing it on the keyboard like that and not in the docking view is so that I can switch between the map and see exactly where I'm supposed to be. You can just see the blue line now starting to pull in, meaning the blue line is where I'm going to go, so if that's coming in towards the planet, that means that I'm going to be coming in towards the planet. And as you can see on the bottom, on the nav ball, the green kind of bar, that's how much speed I've got to bleed off to get to where the dotted line is on the planet. Uh, yeah, if you can hear some muse in the background, I've had to lock my cat in another bedroom so that I can actually do this recording. Okay, well, I'm going to speed time up a bit just so you don't have to watch all of this. Um, and here we go. We're now ready to disconnect the other stage. It's done its part. The retro rockets are now going to fire away. And now we're just a dead weight returning to the planet. And that's the right continent underneath us. Um, the map doesn't account for aerodynamic drag, so I'm really hoping I'm not going to hit those mountains. The, the air should slow us down enough, and if not, the parachute should after this. We're on cue after the heat effects have finished. Oh, and you can see them inside the capsule this time. I'm coming in a bit steeper than the last mission, so they're a bit more strong. And I have got a bit of a spin on, but that's okay. I think I must have not been directly facing forwards when, when I first touched the air. But we're through. Nice. I've just uh, engaged SAS to stop any kind of swinging about for when the parachute opens. I do love this cockpit, and this is a stock cockpit, so really well done to Squad for doing this. And as you can see that wheel there, that means that I'm at 10,000 feet, but if I'm coming in over the mountains, I don't know if that's radar altitude, which would be distance to the highest point underneath me, or whether that's to sea level. I'm not sure how that one works. I'm guessing sea level because all I know is on planes they have a similar dial like that, and that's for sea level. But we'll see. And now because I'm just a falling weight, I'm pointing directly retrograde. And vertical speed is minus 146 meters a second, which, as you can probably guess, is too hard to hit the ground with, so I'm going to have to open that parachute. And there you go, it's just opened, and now we're down to 8 metres a second in some really hilly terrain. But we're on the right continent, they can probably just send out a car for us. They'd have to go through some mountains to get there, but a Kerbal can get into space now, so driving through mountains shouldn't be that much of a problem. Well, I'm prepared to call this one mission successful. Thanks everyone for watching, please leave any comments or... Please like this video, and don't forget that you can subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button underneath the video, or, oops, <laughs> or by clicking on it on the video itself, and I'll see you next time.